Morning again. My name is Dave Chapman. Uh, we're a member of the uh, Wilderness uh, Center Wood Carvers Club also. And uh, we're round two. We're going to be talking about um, pyrography or wood burning. Uh, back several hundred years ago, it's been around for hundreds of years. Uh, they used to call it poker art because they actually used rods with different uh, form tips on them that they heated up in a forge and then transferred uh, the heated tip to a piece of wood and um, put designs or elementary drawings or figures uh, on, the, on, the, uh, on the wood. Over the years, as the um, uh, yeah, <laughs> over the years, as things have evolved and the uh, equipment uh, became more sophisticated, uh, along with that, of course, it, the people became more, more and more people became in, uh, interested in it, and the, it became a, a true art form in the sense that there were some people with some very tremendous talent begin to uh, hone their craft in, in this particular art form. There, uh, today, the pieces of uh, equipment that we use is very sophisticated. Uh, Carrie, I don't know if I can set some, some of this stuff down in front of the camera here. This is probably the one that you're most familiar with. Uh, this is the one I started with myself a few years back. And, uh, and then I graduated to a razor tip. The actual piece that I use is more like a pencil. I feel like I have more control over it. And uh, so that's why I kind of graduated to that one. Not because this one was bad, it just suited my hand better because I have small hands. Uh, so you can get started in, in pyrography at a very minimal cost, less than 50 bucks. The only thing that I would encourage people, if you invest in one of these, make sure you get one that has a uh, rheostat on it, or uh, if you've already got one that doesn't have a rheostat for like 20 bucks, you can buy an extension cord that has a rheostat on it that you can uh, adjust your heat temp uh, temperature on it. And uh, it helps tremendously in being, being able to control what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, here again, like what uh, Keith was saying in the first session, and we were talking about, um, um, you wanna come back over here. Uh, uh, in the first session, we were talking about safety. Uh, when you're working with knives or gouges, you're gonna cut yourself. I've made a few trips to the emergency room myself, so I can relate to that. Uh, but with uh, pyrography, you won't necessarily cut yourself, but you can burn yourself. So you want to make sure when you begin to set up an area to, to begin to work with, uh, if you're working at a dining room table, maybe get a scrap piece of plywood or whatever to put over the surface of your, of your table so you don't... Uh, mar it in any way accidentally and then uh, make sure there's nothing flammable around that can catch on fire and make sure that uh, there's no little hands or fingers or pets around that they could inadvertently get uh, burnt uh, or you having to pay attention to them and you inadvertently burn yourself so those are those are the two things. Those are the things that I would recommend. And also, especially with the uh, more primitive piece, uh, like what we were mentioning earlier, like this one here, uh, it will throw off some heat back on you. So a lot of people wear gloves. This is one that I wear. It's very very thin. Other people just take a work glove like this. This is my carving glove. 
uh, I need heavy duty. Uh, and um, so anything that works for you, uh, that's, that's the mo most important thing that I can think of. Um, become familiar with your, your unit, play with it. Get a scrap piece of wood and just sit and put the different nibs in, the, in your unit and uh, see what, what kind of uh, designs are applicable to that particular nib. And uh, everyone will have its own personality or idiosyncrasy that you can see what you can do and what you can't do with them. That by doing that, that will familiarize yourself as to you're going to, from one different type of art project to another, you'll know, you'll begin to learn what works and applicable to that particular thing that you're wanting to accomplish and what is not. So those are some things that I would encourage you to do. Uh, to get started, most of the stuff that you have around the house is all you, you, all you need other than investing in, in a particular uh, wood burner. Uh, a mask would be good. Uh, just a dust mask like this. Uh, athletic tape. Keith mentioned about the, the different types of tapes. I like athletic tape. I can tape my fingers with that. I use that when I'm carving. And when I'm done, I can just rip it off and throw it in the trash can. Uh, but it's also good if, if you, this glove that I have, the tips of the glove are, are cut out. So often, sometimes if I'm working on especially hardwoods, it throws back heat and I will tape the tips of my fingers so they don't get too hot. Um, a small fan, you can go to five and under and get a small fan like this to use for exhaust and you set it so that it the fumes and the, and the stuff exhausts away from you. Um, an ashtray or a magnetic tray like this is good for when you're having to change out nibs. You can just throw them in here while they cool off. And th that's, that's a handy little, little trick that I learned. Um, towel to wipe uh, things with. Uh, I, uh, I will oftentimes too, especially in the summertime, my hands have a tendency to sweat. So I will lay the towel over the, my piece of work and rest my hand on the towel so that my, the oils from my hand and the sweat doesn't go into the wood uh, so, and uh, mess up my, my art that I'm trying to create. Um, a piece of sandpaper, because you want to be pre pre prepping your piece of wood with sanding. I usually start with 220 and I'll, most people uh, just end with 220 and, and, and go from there and get ready to go. I guess I'm more particular and I will sand mine down to 400 and then I will take like almost like a polishing cloth and polish it down to almost a thousand grit so that it's silver smooth. And that way the nib of my pyrography pen slides very easily over, over the, uh, the wood. And it also allows a better, cleaner burn found that to be very helpful. And uh, depending on the transfer technique that you do for your art that we'll talk about here in a moment, uh, witch hazel I've found to be very helpful in cleaning off, especially uh, if you're using graphite paper, don't use carbon paper. Carbon paper, if you use it and you burn into the carbon, the carbon itself will burn actually into the wood and you'll find it very difficult. It'll It'll mess up your art. So use graphite paper. And when you're done, take and put a little bit of, uh, on your towel and wipe the wood and the graphite uh, will come right up and off there. Real simple and easy. Um, something else you need to keep your nibs clean or the tips of your pen because the, you'll get carbon buildup on them and periodically you need to wipe them off. Uh, 
I just took a piece of bar burlap, uh, I mean, um, denim, a pair of jeans that I had that was no good anymore. And I just cut a piece of it off and wrapped it around a piece of wood. And periodically, I'll just take and wipe my nib on there and uh, keep it clean so that uh, you get a good cl clean um, uh, burn. Depending on the type of wood burner that you're using uh, for this type of wood burner, you'll need a pair of needle nose pliers or something to reach in there and grab a hold of those to screw them in and out uh, without getting burnt. If you're using this type of wood burner, these have uh, screws on them. All you need is a, is a screwdriver, which is nice. Um, we mentioned the mask. I'm working down through my list here. Uh, I think that pretty well does it. Oh, a good source of light. Uh, when, you're, when you're doing something like this, you want something that you can use and where I, I suggest is putting the light, if you're right-handed, you wanna put the light on your left side. If you're left-handed, you wanna put the light on your right side so that um, you don't create shadows with your arms or your hands or your fingers and not be able to see where you're, where you're burning at. But also you can position once you begin to get more confident with your wood burning, maybe even a secondary light so that it, you have, you know how to shade your piece of art and it will, and, um, it will create a, that will be your dominant light source. The other one's a work source. The other one's a light source for creating um, your, you know, which side the shade for your shadow on your, on your art and which side is a, um, is sh uh, showing where your direction of the, your light's coming from. You, I'll show you that in a minute. Um, there's several ways you can transfer a piece of art onto wood. This is the project we're going I figured this would be appropriate. This is a piece of art, artwork that I created um, a while back to, um, uh, and to transfer something like this onto a piece of wood, you can use uh, graphite paper. It would be very time consuming to transfer this. You, you're drawing it twice, basically. So with something like this, usually what I'll do is I will take this, put it in a laser printer or an inkjet and get a photocopy of it, lay it on top of my wood and put it face down. And then you can transfer that one of two ways. You can do it, take and put douse it with mineral spirits and then rub it with a uh, smooth piece of wood on the back to transfer that, that uh, image onto the wood. The other way is to do it with heat. You uh, take some tape, some masking tape, some painter's tape uh, and tape your artwork to the, to the wood and then and do that. Or with the heat, take a, 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 um, an iron, or this particular type of heat uh, has a nib that you can put on here that looks, uh, that's very flat, makes it look like a minesweeper or a, one of those things that you uh, look for metal, metal detector. And you heat that up and you can take and rub that over your, um, your art and uh, it will transfer the image on there and it can, Carrie, you got that? We're good, yeah. Okay, if you see, this is one that I did with a with an iron, and I did it a little bit heavy. If you'll notice right down in here, this is a piece of birch plywood, and it, it burnt the wood a little bit. So you can overburn it. If it's a solid piece of wood, it's a little more forgiving, but the, but plywood uh, is not so for forgiving. But I just wanted to. To, I did this on purpose so that you can see what can happen if you leave 
the heat source in one place too long. You can get the, the get it transferred, but uh, there's some side effects. Another thing um, that um, I might mention, you can burn on any type of wood, but the ones I found for myself to be uh, consistent and practical for the type of wood burning that I do, uh, birch plywood is good. This is just quarter inch. Uh, I also like, hot, if I'm using solid wood, basswood works very well. I like hollywood and buckeye. Um, they have literally no green effect to it and it's pure white. So if you're looking for something to get a good contrast, that's a very good way to go. Um, another thing though, you can use different hardwoods. The only thing I caution you with hardwoods is many of the hardwoods uh, give off a toxic gas. So that's where the mask comes into play. And uh, I always, regardless, I'm usually got a mask on uh, so that um, I don't have an oops moment, especially also with plywood because of the laminate, being a laminated material the glues and stuff in there, uh, they get hot, create a gas. I don't want to be sucking it. I'm sure you don't either. Uh, but um, once you get everything transferred, then you're pretty much ready to go. But before you take your artwork off, take and lift it and make sure that everything has transferred the way you want it. If for some reason there's places that are missing, you can take and lay it back down and rub it some more. Or what I oftentimes do is I'll lay it back and it's usually just real small areas. I will take a number two pencil and just very, very lightly fill it in. So, because all you're doing is creating a roadmap for yourself for burn, burning. Now this particular project that I've got here, and I, can you see that? Uh, if you can see closely, I've created this artwork that everything is going to be done with dots. I don't know if they still have in art stores the paint by number things. I remember my mom doing that when I was a kid. Uh, that's where I got the idea. But instead of by numbers, I did it with dots. That way, once you, someone who is beginning, I wanted to create something so that you could have a positive experience right off the bat and look at something that when you're done, you can be very proud of. And when um, you get everything transferred over and double check it, make sure everything looks good, you peel it off and you're ready to start you're you're ready to start uh, burning one nice thing about the pen also that i might mention is it heats up very fast and it cools down real real fast the other unit it heats up slow and it cools down slow that's one of the, another reason why i went with this but the primary reason was because i felt i felt i had more control over this because i got small hands and this is more like a pencil. But when you're ready to go, all you have to do is you, you find a dot and you, you burn a dot. You just put, put it on there. Oops, I got turned down. I, got, I usually turn my, my unit up to about a number five and as you can see, there you go. There's a dot, there's a dot. Okay, I'm kind of laying this on the side. Actually, I should be having this more perpendicular like this because you can get a better, more round burn. And the longer you leave, the, leave it on the wood, the more it's gonna burn. You can turn the heat up if you want to, but by putting it 
at a moderate heat of around four or five, you're ready to go. Are we, are we on? Can you see what we're doing? Yeah. Okay. Um, if you need, need to, you can go back. If it's not as light, as dark as you want, you can go back over it. Just keep hitting it till you get the, get the, the darkness or contrast that you want. And once you learn the idiosyncrasies of your unit, you'll get a pretty good idea how quick it burns. There's three different ways of being able to create contrast. One is the length of time that the nib is on the, on the wood or by repetition, going back over like that, or the close, closeness. Now, like up here in the mouth area, we're gonna do these here in the mouth and we're gonna put these all real close. And when, we, when it's all said and done, it'll look like the opening in his mouth. And it's just that simple. You're not pushing hard. You let the unit do the burning. And like I said, if it's not as, as dark as you want, you just go back and hit it again. Now I've tried to create this, this style of teaching with beginners. And if it goes over well, I call it instead of paint by dot or paint by number, it's paint by dot. I've got some other artwork that I want to convert over to this type of, of um, uh, style. And um, all you have to do is transfer your artwork to your wood and then just start hitting the dots. It's just that simple. But um, we'll zoom in a little bit. Here. Zoom in a little bit. Okay. She carries tremendous. She's she's our technical expert, and she's doing an incredible job here at the Wilderness Center. Kudos to her for helping us out in this situation. But I'm going to put my eyeballs on here. Being an old guy, I feel like I'm blind in one eye and can't see out the other. So oftentimes I have to take and magnify so that I can see the artwork myself because we try to keep the the transfer as light as possible, but not so light that you can't see it. But you don't want a real heavy piece on there that it um, leaves so much of a residue that you can't get it off. So that's the reason, and also in different applications, that becomes very critical. With the dots, it's not so much because you're just you're just overdoing the dots that, that are in here, as you can see. But with other art, so, uh, different types of um, wood burning that I'll make reference to here in a second, I've got a piece behind me here that I did for my wife. I really didn't get into this wood burning too much up until about three years ago. Uh, I had major back surgery and they wouldn't let me carve because of the pushing and pulling on it. And it put too much stress on my back. So I would decide I was gonna to try to do two things during that time of convalescence, I decided I was going to try to teach myself how to draw. And I taught and also hone my skills in wood burning because wood burning is something that uh, is a kind of a carryover or another tool, if you will, that you'll find in uh, uh, that very applicable to, uh, to carving. Uh, if we can, Shoot back here, Carrie. I don't know if that's possible or not. Uh, 
I've got this piece back here. My wife, some friends of ours went to um, Israel and while they were there, they went into this chapel and this was a, this was a mural behind or on the wall in this chapel. And they post, they liked it so much, they posted it on their Facebook page. And my wife comes to me, she says, David, David, she says, what do you think? Meaning, will you burn this for me? And I'm looking at this, I'm going, oh, yeah, I just kind of freaked out over that. But I, you can't turn your wife down. So I tried my best to do this. I've got in excess of 300 hours in this. But this is a totally different style of wood burning. This is with shading, not dots. But um, one of the things that I didn't mention in choosing a piece of wood, for, uh, you have to look at your piece of wood and the piece of art that you're wanting to put on it. And if there's any blemishes in it, can you use that blemish to your advantage? Or do you need to place your artwork someplace where it's not going to be a negative to your artwork? Now, over here, there's a, a staff. And right here is a knot. And I try to position my artwork so that that um, knot was incorporated into the actual art. Maybe I'm lazy in this. In fact, that I just uh, didn't want to have to create a lot and burn a knot. It was actually right there already, so I didn't have to can be concerned about that. But that, that's one other thing that you might consider uh, before you begin a piece is the positioning of your art. If there is some blemishes in the wood, uh, what you're going to be able to do with it and what you can't. Uh, and maybe you can get those blemishes to work for you instead of against you. Um, I throw that out at no extra charge. Uh, anyway, um, getting back to our Santa Claus here. Uh, you can just continue to burn even the even the little snowflakes here. We can um, all done in dots. Even the outline of it, just very, when you touch the wood, it's almost like tickling somebody with a feather. Very, very lightly. You let the unit do the burning. And like I said before, if it's not dark enough for you, you can just go back over it. Very, very simple. I've tried to make this as simple as I can. Um, it's something like this when you, uh, after us working together, and you can see how simplistic this is, and you're interested in maybe doing something with uh, wood burning, I'm going to, uh, leave a copy of this artwork with uh, Carrie that she can post on their Facebook page. And uh, if you wanna download it and get after it, you're welcome to it. I, I, there's no charge. And if we get enough of a interest in it, I will develop, I already have some other pieces um, that I want to convert over. My um, granddaughter who lives in Texas loves to dance ballet. Well, her mother is very accomplished at ballet. She teaches it at the Texas University there in Tyler. And um, so for Christmas one year, I took and created a piece with a ballerina and a ballet shoe. And uh, when I started studying and thinking about expanding 
the possibilities if there is interest on this. That I thought that would be a real good piece to uh, convert over. And then I've got another one that is an eagle. I don't know about you folks, but I'm really into eagles. So, um, if um, you go on, I think we submitted some pictures of some art that we've done and some explanations on their stories behind that. I did a piece here this past winter for a good friend of mine. And um, he and his dad have done some masonry work for me over the years. And bless her heart, they wouldn't ever let me pay him for it. And I felt extremely awkward about that. So the last time we got together, I said, Scott, man, you got, you got to let me pay you. And of course we got into that ping pong match and I said, all right. I said, what, what intrigues you? What do you like? He says, well, my wife and I like Eagles. I said, you got it. So I started putting together some artwork Unfortunately, in the process of doing that, his dad died quite suddenly. And so I modified the artwork since he was a Vietnam vet. I still had my eagle, but I created the piece to be a memoriam to his dad. And um, I gave it to him and I, I think that they have really enjoyed it, especially his mom. But um, as you can see, it's coming together. You can see the the snowflake is coming alive. Hey, David. Yeah. We have a question. Yeah. So the shading for the Santa Claus is based on how close your dots are together, as well as how you how long you keep uh, your wood your wood burning tool on the wood. Yes. So yep. if you want it darker, if you want it darker, you put the dots closer together as well. If, if, if you're wanting a, a dominant darkness, yeah. You just like up here in the mouth, as you can see up here where, where we're doing their mouth, I didn't finish it, but because I just want, was kind of sampling that, but yeah, the closer the dots, the more dominant the darkness. Um, maybe we can maybe go up here into the nose this is another area that of shading. The one side, you can see the light source is coming this way. So as a result, if there's going to be any darkness or dominant shading, it's going to be on this side of his face. Okay. Or in the recesses between his beard and his nose and so on, on his mouth, or I mean on his face. But if along this side here, We're going to, here again, put the dots close together and bunch them to create the shading on this side of his nose to create dimension and depth. Because basically, when you're do doing something like this, it, it creates dimension Lighter shades give an appearance of being closer to the to the forefront. Darker shades have create an image of being farther away from the for, um, the from the forefront. It's more or less in the background or in a crevice, if you will. So by by doing this, that's what you're trying to to give that illusion. Now in the eyes. Let's go up here and start. We can do this one eye a little bit. You can see all we're doing is just a series of a bunch of little dots. Okay. And like you said earlier, this is a different technique than you did for your mural. Your the, mural is based on shading where this is yeah, based on dots. Right. And the reason I wanted to do this is to make it more simplistic 
so uh, so that it was more applicable for someone who getting started. Hopefully it would spur your interest to um, maybe begin to hone your craft. Like, I, you know, I just, that was one of the things that tripped my trigger was to um, um, begin to um, um, just get better. There's lots of books. There's YouTube video tutors out there for this kind of stuff. Uh, Gal by Anima. Uh, Manissa Robinson uh, from Colorado, very, very good, very good teacher. She's got some videos out and some books out, um, but a lot of people, there's a lot of good biographies out there. You, be, you, you Google biography, you're going to see some pieces that will take your breath away. You can't believe it. some of them look like an actual photograph. They're phenomenal. Uh, I wish I was that good. I'm I'm still a beginner. I've only actually been doing this for about three years. So and we have another question, David. Yep. Is it better to start light and go darker as needed later? Yes. Uh, especially once you get into the shading, the dots, you can, um, you pretty much know where you're going with it, but it doesn't hurt to go lighter and then and then as you begin as the the uh, uh, pictures starts to develop then you can kind of blend things together so that you've got continuity and you create the image that you're looking for it's always easier to go darker once it's dark you can't go back and sand it off or erase it like you can a pencil sketch uh, so that's that's a good thing but when you get into the shading most definitely Another thing that I might show people, when I started to do this big uh, project for my wife, I don't know what my wife did it. I must not have, must not have got him. Anyway, uh, Manissa Robinson told me, she says, oftentimes in a big project, you will look at the whole pro at the project as a whole, and as a result, it will intimidate you just like this one did. So what I did is I took a piece of cardboard and created like a little window and took that at different places where I was gonna work and I could focus just on that particular part of the work that I was working on. And it blocked my eyes from the rest of the picture. And so I could focus on just that area. And then when I got that done or almost done, I would begin to move it to a different area, maybe adjacent to it, blend the two together and keep on moving. And that way I did it piece by piece. Instead of trying to eat the whole olive at once, I was doing it one bite at a time. It was far less intimidating. So that would be another tip for any big project down the road that you, that you might attempt to do. And some folks, even these dots, I know um, might seem intimidating, but I think after doing it for a few minutes, uh, you'll begin to realize, hey, I can do this. This is fun. And that's exactly the goal that I wanted to accomplish is to create people's interest in this art form and um, get people doing it and hooked on it the way I am. And uh, you find that it's a great way to get self-satisfaction, uh, self uh, an accomplishment where, especially we've been all cooped up for the last several months. I can go up in my, my uh, where I work at in my second floor of my house, turn my radio on, got some good music and I'll start on a project. And all of a sudden my wife is saying, hey, it's ready for supper or are you going to bed tonight? And you don't realize all this time has gone by because you're having so much fun and you're focusing on something and whatever's going on out there that's super negative, you're not even thinking about it. 
you're just totally concentrating on what you're supposed to be doing. How are we doing on time wise, Carrie? About five minutes. Five minutes, okay. Let me wrap up by just saying this. Uh, I hope what I've shared with you today is something that uh, you'll find interest in. If you do, uh, let Carrie know, get on the, the Facebook page here at, um, at the Wilderness Center and let her know what's going on. Uh, if, if need be, we could do more of these, uh, these classes. I would love to do that. But the one thing that I want to encourage people to realize, if you goof up, you goof up. It's just a piece of wood. So you can start over again. It's just like a baby learning how to walk. You fall down, you pick yourself up, and you keep on going. Don't be intimidated. Um, just realize that this type of art form is an exercise of patience, focus, and tenacity. It's not a sprint. It's not going to happen necessarily overnight. Uh, to do this project here, it usually takes me a half a day to get it accomplished. Now, if you're like a lot of people, especially young mothers, or uh, it might take you a week to do it because you might have 15 minutes here, 10 minutes there, whatever. You know, when the kids are down for a nap, you work on it and it helps you kind of calm down, de-stress. It's a great de-stressor. Uh, but anyway, um, that's my encouragement. And I, I hope you enjoyed watching what uh, we had to share today. And uh, let Carrie know what you think. And we'll, we'll go from there. Any other questions? Anybody else has any questions? OK. Uh, if anybody would like to type door prize into the comments at this point, you are eligible to win a door prize. We'll give everybody just a second for that. Well, there is quite a bit of them. All right. We will be in touch with door prize winners. Thank you all. Thanks, David. And um, we'll see you in a little bit for the continuation of live with Tarzan Show. Okay. Good deal. I hope that worked out good. good.